right, um, we're going to go ahead and get the steel started a bit early today. Like I said, we're going to end at around 11.25, so I'm going to be rocking and rolling to try and get through stuff uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, before we do, any questions on the homework that's due on Monday? All right. It's, in all honesty, at least compared to the concrete design uh, homework, it should be a lot more straightforward because it's a lot more lookups and the calculations are a lot more rote. Whereas with the concrete design homework, there was a lot more that you kind of had to figure out. So that's not the case really with this one. Um, again, just expect an email from me soon on Engineering 452. Uh, and then uh, also just make sure that you're bringing your manuals. We're actually going to use the manuals today um, directly. So uh, you're going to wait, make sure you start bringing those. And if you need to sit next to somebody that has theirs, don't be shy. Okay, let's get into it. So last time we talked about tension members. So this is the first type of member that we're going to assess in this class. Um, uh, basically taking a piece of steel and yanking on it. What is the maximum capacity and then how do you design a tension member to withstand that, uh, that load? And so we talked about last time the definition of a limit state. In other words, a condition that we define uh, as structural engineers that uh, members have to uh, satisfy. And so one of those conditions, for instance, for tension members is yielding in the gross section. So we limit the stress in the gross section to Fy. And so the capacity um, of a tension member according to yielding in the gross section is the yield stress Fy times the gross area. That's the nominal capacity. We then adjust that by our resistance factor, which we'll deal with resistance factors and stuff later, so we don't need to worry about that too much right now, um, but resistance factor for yielding uh, is 0.9, uh, yielding in the gross section. For fracture in the next section, that's failure along the region of the connection, which is really kind of what we're going to be focusing on today is the next section. Um, we limit that stress not to the yield stress, but to the ultimate tensile stress. We don't care a lot about a little bit of yielding around the, um, uh, the connection region because it doesn't amount to much deformation. It doesn't amount to much elongation of the member. Um, but fracture is obviously a big deal because that means that the member is actually separating. And so that's a lot more of a worst case scenario. So as a result, we limit our, or we use our fee value of 0.75. Um, effective net area, we'll talk about the effects of shear lag later so that you understand uh, what it is. But it's basically sort of a detail, relate, uh, a stress related phenomenon related to the stresses at the connection uh, and, and that it's not uniform. But we'll talk about that uh, later. Um, block shear, we will also talk about block shear, but that's a little bit down the ways. That's after we start looking at design. It's not hard to compute, but if I showed you the formula now, it'd be so we got to deal with um, uh, the uh, other individual components first. What I want to focus on today is net area, specifically how to compute it. Um, it's not hard, um, but there's a couple conceptual ideas that you kind of need to visualize. So in general, for bolted connections, the gross area equals or the net area equals the gross area minus the area lost due to bolt holes. You're removing material from the section when you're placing a, 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 a bolt in there. Um, we're going to take this formula and make it a little more rigorous later. Right now, that formula is very uh, uh, um, soft, I guess I would say. It's, you know, there's no variables and symbols and things like that. We're going to uh, amp that up here in a bit. Um, the last thing before we get into examples is I want to talk about the note on the bolt holes itself. Um, if you have a bolt, let's say it's a three-quarter inch diameter bolt, for tension members we assume the hole, let's say if it's, if it's a half inch diameter bolt, the hole is five-eighths of an inch in diameter. So we add an eighth of an inch to, uh, to compute the hole diameter. And obviously you need the diameter of the hole if you're going to compute the, the net area. And the reason we do that is because we had 1 16th of an inch to account for the fact that we actually drilled the hole physically larger than the bolt so that you can actually stick the bolt in the hole. Um, you have to drill it a little larger. So we drill it usually 1 16th larger. So you can think it's a 32nd of an inch on each side. So the diameter is a 16th, uh, 16th of an inch larger. The uh, other 16th of an inch, if you've ever seen a hole drilled in steel, it can be a little nasty. You know, you've got the burrs and, and so on and so forth. And so we basically assume that, that little lip of material around the hole, we don't really consider that effective in transferring set, uh, stress across the section. So as a result, we don't, uh, we don't account for that in tension members. We will account for that when we actually look at the physical connection itself, but not now. So let's look at the net area of this plate shown. So 
Let me show you what I've got going on here so, so that you understand the diagram. What I have here is a very simple tension member. It's just a plate, you know, and, you know, it's sort of like this. It's sort of going on forever. And it's got a connection here at the end of eight bolts, okay? And so what I'm looking at is this plate in the middle. Now, if, if I have this plate, you know, in some members, this is sort of looking at it on the side, so you can sort of think of the hole sort of going like that. It has to connect to something, you know. If I have a structure, you know, I have, let's say, a tension member. Well, I've got these holes. What is it connected to? So what I'm going to say is I've got similar plates, you know, up here and similar plates down here. So that's what it's connected to, okay. Um, I, I'm not really worried about those plates right now. Um, we'll talk about that stuff later. But for now, I'm just looking at this member and I'm asking myself, what's the net area, okay. Now, this plate is 8 inches wide, so this dimension here, this is 8 inches wide, and its thickness is 3 eighths of an inch. So if you want some dimension, that's 3 eighths, and this dimension here is 8, okay? Now, whenever you're computing net area, the very first step is to compute the gross area. So this is probably going to be a pretty simple question. What do you think the gross area of a plate that's 8 inches wide and 3 three eighths of an inch thick? What's the gross area of that plate? Say it again. And how'd you do that? Exactly right. Pretty simple, right? So if I'm looking at example 2A, So, the gross area, so um, so AG is 8 inches times 3 eighths of an inch, which is 3 square inches. Sound good? Alright, now. Second thing we need to look at is the hole diameter. Now, we have a, a problem dealing with a bolt diameter that's three quarters of an inch. I'll go ahead and tell you that three quarter inch bolts in structural applications is one of the most common bolt diameters you will deal with. Three quarter inch, seven eighths inch, and one inch are like the most common bolt diameters. Uh, that we deal with in structural steel applications. So you'll see three quarter inch bolts a lot in here. Now if I got a three quarter inch bolt, what's the hole diameter that we're going to use? Seven eighths. So DH is DB plus an eighth of an inch. So three quarters plus an eighth or seven eighths. Okay. Now, here's the kicker. We have the diameter of the hole. What's the area of the hole? Let me help me out. Pi v squared over 4, right? No, it's not. Okay. That sounds like the right answer. It's not. Here's why. What's the secret weapon of structural engineering? It's a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan. What we're talking about here with this problem, we have a section. So here's, here's our member, right? And so we can assume, you know, sort of the member goes on forever and we're yanking on it like this with some load. And it's got, you know, bolt, 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 bolt. We're yanking on it. Okay, so when we yank on it, samurai sword or a lightsaber, we cut like that, right? So our section cut is going about like that, right? Now, let's test Dr. Mike's three-dimensional art skills. Let's look at this piece that's cut out. Let's see if, if this makes sense. So I've got, you know, a plate like this. It's going like that. And so I've got a hole, a hole, a hole, a hole, a hole. But I cut.
cut right through the hole. So that cut like that, about like that. So if I've got the plate, does it make sense that I've kind of got this thing going on? So here's what I propose. The net area is this red shaded region. In other words, think about it like this. Imagine if I samurai sword or lightsaber right through that section, and then I took that plate and I dipped it in ink and I tapped it right there. That's what would show up red on the page, right? Okay. This net area is the gross area minus the area lost due to a bulb hole. I'm asking you, what is the area lost due to a single bulb hole? It's not pi b squared over 4. It's what? It's one over no, just just this space here is the diameter times the thickness, right? Because say, if I'm cutting through the plate, right? If I'm cutting through here, what what got removed? That section right there. And what is the area of that little rectangle? Remember, you're just talking about that plane. And so imagine imagine taking a cylinder and slicing a cylinder in half and looking at it. What is that area? It's the diameter of the cylinder times its height, or in this case, the thickness of the plate. Does that make sense? And how many bolts would we be cutting through when we're cutting through a section? Two of them. So I propose then that therefore, the net area is the gross area minus two bolt holes. 2 times the diameter times the thickness. So what does that come out to be? We'll say two decimal places doesn't need to be super fancy. Two point three four. Two point three four. Do I have a second on that? Not too bad, right? Not too shabby. Yes, sir. Oh, what does the T stand for? The plate thickness. This plate. This problem had a three eighths inch thick plate. That's that's a great question, and and that's that's going to become important. Or that's going to become more prescriptive here in our next problem because we're going to have to be a little specific about what we're talking about. Sound good? All right. Any questions on this? All right. Next problem. Is, is very similar. Now we're going to compute the net area of a rolled shape. So now, instead of a plate, I'm looking at a W10 by 49. Okay? I'm looking at a W10 by 49, and I got two lines of bolts in each flange. The bolts are three quarter inch in diameter. Okay? Now I promise you it's the same process. Okay? We're trying to determine the net area. On that last problem, what was the first step in determining the net area? Finding the gross area. My question for you, what is the gross area of a W10 by 49? You look up the, the W10 the area of a W10 by 49 using your AISC Steel Construction Manual 15th edition that's turquoise that you bring with you to class every time, right? That, that, yeah. Well, you're not getting out of it. In fact, Ms. Ms. Burnham, I need your help if you can tell me the, the area of a W10 by 49 using AISC 15th edition Steel Construction Manual. Now, if you're seeing colors, you're too far ahead. 
need to be in table 1-1. And don't close your manual because we're going to need it here in a second. So it's going to be a W shape. Somebody help me out. Does somebody have the area of a W10 by 49? 14.4. So example 2B. So the gross area. So AG is 14.4 inches squared. Now what table are you in? You're in table 1-1? Uh, yes. What page are you on? 1-28. 1-28. So, right off the bat, if you're not there, I want you to find that. Make sure that everybody is able to find that value. Oops, oh, sorry. 49. 10 by 49. I'll put that up. Keep that page open. We're not done with it yet. All right. Remind me with this problem. Well, I'll tell you what. No, let's, not, let's not do it like that. Let's look at it like this. Now, what we have is a wide flange with two lines of bolts in each flange. So help me out. When I subtract bolts for net area, how many bolts am I going to have to subtract? Four. Samurai sword or lightsaber through the cross sections right here. One, two, three, four. What are the diameter of those holes going to be? Three quarter inch diameter bolts. What's the hole diameter? All right, that's exactly right. Now, I just looked up the gross area for a W10 by 49. Can you think of any other value I might need for a W10 by 49? The thickness of what? Plate. The flange. That's exactly right. Remember, these are the flanges. That is the web. Okay? So we need the thickness of the flange. Now, what is the flange thickness of a W10 by 49? 0 0.56. 0 0.56. Now, there are two numbers listed, right? There's a 0.56 and there's something else, probably like 5 eighths or something like that. Or 9 sixteenths. 9 sixteenths, okay. <clears throat> Which one do you use? You always use the decimal value. If you use the fractional value for the math, you might as well take out your hand and do that. Don't use the fractional values for the math. That's for the AutoCAD folks. Okay? So, we've got the gross area. We've got hole diameter. So, DB, three quarter. DH is seven eighths. Flange thickness. TF is 0 0.56. And so therefore, the net area is the gross area minus 4 DHTF. So we wrote TF here as opposed to T because we're talking about the flange thickness. If they were going through the web, we would write the web thickness. So that's why I was saying on the last problem we just put T. We put T sub F here because of what they were going through. And so we try and make sure that we're cognizant of the symbology that we're using. So we have 14.4, that's inches squared, not inches, minus 4 times 7 eighths of an inch times um, 0 0.560. And so net area equals what? We'll say two decimal places.
12.44. Do I have a second on that? That's exactly correct. Not too shabby, right? This isn't that hard. I, I mean, what, what I'm trying to do is introduce you to this math, which is really pretty basic, but also introduce you to this. Okay? Another thing that hopefully this exercise taught you is the value of these, the tabs in your manual. Okay? Because if you're on an exam and you're sitting there flipping just trying to find the table versus if I have a tab, I'm going to find it faster than you. Even if I know the anatomy of the manual or not, you know, just because it's, it, it's bookmarked. So having some bookmarks for wide flanges and angles and things like that is, is, is pretty valuable. So I would definitely suggest that I'm um, taking this back. All right. So far so good? Yes, sir? Is it always an eighth of, a, an, eighth of an inch no matter the size of the bolt? Yes, for standard size holes. Um, there are instances where oversized holes or slotted holes are necessary in various applications. So. For instance, if you have a fixed bearing versus an expansion bearing in a bridge, the expansion bearing is going to use slotted holes uh, and things like that. Um, but for our purposes, standard size holes are pretty much an eighth of an inch larger for, for typical bolt diameters. Um, again, though, when we get to connection land, that's going to change, and so y'all aren't going to like me very much. I'm just telling you that. What do you mean when you say slotted holes? S like a slotted hole, like the hole is... Oh, so it can move. Yeah, yeah, so it can move, yeah. Like if, if it's like an oval, well not an oval, but just imagine a, like a circle that just went like that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Are we good? All right. I, I got to believe this is pretty simple. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to explain what happens when this gets complicated, and then we're going to call it because I, I have to end class a little early today. So what I've done is I've now given us a formula that's a little bit more prescriptive. Okay, so the net area equals the gross area minus the bolt holes, which is the sum of the diameters of the holes times the thicknesses that they're going through. Okay, and I think that so far is a pretty reasonable formula so far for what we've been doing. Am I right? I mean, the, the diameter of holes, the bolt plus an eighth or minus an eighth of an inch or, or plus an eighth of an inch, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, that works when you have grid-like rectangular patterns like this. Because when I cut through, I've got a perpendicular uh, a cut or a cut normal to the uh, axis of the member, and I'm cutting through uh, a series of bolts. What happens, however, when it looks like this? Okay, this is a staggered bolt <laughs> arrangement. Okay, now first off, I I'm always of, of the opinion that if you're going to do something that adds a layer of complexity, there needs to be a reason for it. In other words, why would you do this? Why would you stagger your bolts and make the bolt pattern weird? Well, there's a very good reason for it. And the biggest reason is to increase your net area. Why would an engineer want to increase the net area? If you increase the net area, you increase the section's capacity according to fracture in the net section. So if you have a member and you've designed it and then you do the math and you find it doesn't have enough capacity, you could make the member beefier, which would add steel weight to the project and ultimately cost more money, or you could stagger the bolt arrangement and increase your net area so you could use the same member and just drill your holes differently. So basically increasing the strength for no cost. That's why you would do it. But the problem is, is that now we have multiple different possible paths of failure. And all the possible paths have to be investigated uh, that occur on the lead line. I've been teaching this class for a long time, and the one thing that sometimes students get confused about is the lead line. Okay, so let me explain what the lead line is. Okay? Let's say I have a member, and... Now let's say that member goes on forever. And so here's the end of the member, and I've got some staggered bolts like this. Okay? The lead line is all of these bolts that sort of occur on this path. In other words, the way I like to, to, to visualize 
the bolts that occur on the lead line. Imagine taking a big old rubber band and going like this along the member. And as soon as I hit the bolts, all those bolts are the ones that occur on the lead line. That's the lead line of bolts. So let me show you a couple images to sort of ex explain that. So this is a possible failure path. Again, the member goes on forever. So this is the member going on forever. So the rubber band comes this way. This is a bolt uh, path on the lead line. This is a bolt path on the lead line. That's a bolt path on the lead line. Okay. The lead line keeps all of your bolts intact. Okay. Because we're not looking at the bolts right now. We're looking at the failure of the member. We'll look at the bolts later. Okay. Um, notice how these paths have diagonals. It's not just a cut like this one. We have three bolts that we would subtract, but we also have these staggered paths. We have two of them, right? So to go back, like this potential failure path, you would subtract one bolt hole. This path, you would subtract two bolt holes, but you have one staggered path you have to account for. This next one, you're subtracting three bolt holes, but then you have two staggered paths that you have to account for. Does that make sense? So, so they're, 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 they're a, a different level, an upper level of complexity to this. Every time that you encounter a diagonal path, you add what's called a stagger factor. Okay? And a stag the, the, the formula for the stagger factor is S squared over 4G times the thickness. Now, this is one of those empirical expressions. If you actually look at the stresses with all those bolts around on an inclined plane, they get really funky really quick. Um, that formula is super simple, but it works wonders to compute the capacity easily. Okay? So the S is the longitudinal spacing that's in the direction of the load. The G is the gauge spacing that's perpendicular to the load. And then T is obviously the thickness. Now, if you open up the manual, it just says S squared over 4G. It doesn't include the thickness because it's just talking about the path. But you have to multiply by the thickness to get the area because the, you know, for the units to work out uh, and whatnot. Now, don't worry. We're going to explore this on Monday. But I want to show you visually what I mean by the lead line. Again, the lead line considers paths that leave the bolts intact. So watch this. Is this path on the lead line? I say yes, because if it fractures, the bolts remain intact. Now I'm going to ask you, is that on the lead line? If the plate cuts in half, the bolts remain intact. Is that on the lead line? Bolts remain intact. What about that one? Is that on the lead line? No, because for the plate to fracture, and separate, that front bolt has to shear off. So we only check paths that are on the lead line. Don't worry, we're going to check the bolts later. We're going to have explicitly look at threads included and threads excluded and slip connections and bearing connections. Don't worry, we're going to assess that in great detail. All right. So I would argue that a more refined expression for the net area is the gross area minus the area loss due to bolt holes plus any necessary stagger factors. That is the formula for net area. Now, one final thing I'll point out, everything we've been talking about is for bolted connections. There's another way to connect things with steel, and that's welding. So what if you have two members welded together? What is the, gro uh, the net area? It's the gross area. Because you haven't drilled anything, you haven't removed any material. So the net area and the gross area are identical when you're dealing with a welding connection. In most cases, at least with fillet welds uh, that, that we deal with in here. So there are some instances where you might remove some material, but for the most part, net area equals gross area. Does that sound good? That's what we're going to do on Monday. That right there. We are going to uh, assess uh, a staggered connection. We're going to look at uh, this connection here, which is a plate. Then we're going to look at an angle, okay? Uh, after that, we'll, we'll get into shear lag and actually start getting some capacity. Whew. Sound good? Digest that. We'll tackle staggered connections on Monday. That's all I got, everybody.
Thank you.